Why, hello, and welcome to our webinar Wednesday series. My name is Elizabeth Hamlin. I'm going to be your host today with Mr. Tom Weir, one of our lead consultants at the CSUB SBDC. Welcome, everyone. We're so happy that you could join us today. We're going to be speaking with Mr. Jim Blassengame, who is a nationally acclaimed author and radio host and columnist, and we're so excited for him to share with us The Age of the Customer, just his third book that he has released. And so let's talk a little bit about America's SBDC. We are a part of the SBDC network, which covers coast to coast uh, of the United States, and we have about a thousand centers which are focused on you know, building community and local economies. And here is the Central California Regional SBDC Network. We are a part of this network, and the CSUB SBDC is in Kern County, Inyo, or in services Kern County, Inyo County, and Mono County. And in this region, we also have four other regional centers which cover the Central Coast and the remaining Central Valley. So webinar interaction, please ask questions. And we wanna let you know all attendees are muted and cameras are off. We ask you if you could please complete the survey that is emailed at the end of the webinar. And you might have also noticed when you click your link through your email, a window popped up on your Internet Explorer or other service or other Internet service. So if you wanna complete it that way, we would love for you to make sure you leave your email address and you'll be entered to win a personalized signed copy from Mr. Blassengame um, of the age of the customer. And also mention in that survey if you would like other materials or handouts. So some webinar tips, as you've noticed, we have Zoom and you must download the software. It's very quick and we're enjoying this new software. And we have we, and we don't have any polls today, but typically there'll be some polls and you please use the question and answer button, which is on the bottom of your screen. And we will try and get to you as quick as possible. We will also be doing a Q&A at the end of the webinar with Mr. Weir and Mr. Blassengame. So what we do at the SBDC, we provide high quality, no cost, confidential one-on-one -on -one consulting and training for small business owners on a variety of topics and medias. And we also have in-depth classes for small business owners. If you would like to sign up to become uh, a, a be client, a client, a business, you. Client, a business <laughs> client, yes. Please visit us at our website at csgb.edu backslash sbdc. And in the top right-hand corner will be a register button and we will Oh, a consultant will get to you as soon as possible. And all our consultations are confidential. 100% confidential. Thank you, Tom. So moderating today, we have Mr. Tom Weir. And Tom, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, I've had a private practice helping business owners who still work in their businesses. Uh, it's kind of flattering when someone can be in business for 18, 20 30 years and they still look to the outside for any help at all but it turns out that often they're looking for a light at the end of the tunnel and it's a, a matter of creating processes for them that's kind of my specialty and then I joined uh, the consultant team over at the uh, Cal State Bakersfield Small Business Development Center which we're broadcasting from now um, what, almost eight years ago when they started in 2010 and have been working with uh, business owners who I become their greatest advocate because I really enjoy their enthusiasm and what they do to help the, the economy of the U.S. Yes, and we're, we're happy to be broadcasting from beautiful downtown Bakersfield in the Mid-State Development Center, or De Development Center building, and... It is a building. It is right. a building. We're not on the street. <laughs> this is all good. Their awesome conference room, which we also like to call Webinar Central. And so my name is Elizabeth Hamlin. I am an associate consultant at the CSUBS BDC and I'm studying business administration and focused in agricultural business. And I am so excited to present Mr. Jim Blassengame. Yay! So Jim. Thank you for that sitting ovation. 
<laughs> Jim is one of the, leading, uh, the world's leading experts on small business and entrepreneurship. He has, he's a creator of an award-winning uh, syndicated weekday radio program called the Small Business Advocate Show since 1997. I highly recommend it if you have five minutes a day to check in and what's going on in business these days. So he's also the author of four books which have sold more than 200,000 copies. And I know that the age of the customer we're covering today is an, a multi-award winner. And his new book just recently released, The Third Ingredient, is also a, a, an award winner. And so he is the champion of small business. He has received the highest award from the America's Small Business Administration and Small Business Development Center. And so, you know, Jim, you can tell us more about yourself. You can tell us about yourself better than I can. Well, let me add, I, I know when I read his book, I literally have changed. Well, I've certainly adjusted the way I talk in terms of marketing and sales because of this book. It was a true eye opener. Uh, I am the old guard. I'm the age of the seller predominantly. And he has, re he has really opened my eyes to uh, better help uh, my clients, I think, at this point on what to really do to steer yourself properly through this paradigm shift that he's going to express uh, over the next hour. All right. So we're going to have Jim take it away on, you know, how the rules of selling have changed, the difference between relevance and competitiveness, and what you can do now to help your business. Thanks, well, thank Jim. You. Thank you, Kent. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Well, I don't want to talk about me anymore. I'm sick of I'm sick of hearing about me. I want to talk about I want to talk about the people who are in our audience. First, I want to say if you're here listening today, or if you're listening to the replay uh, in the future, it's a pretty good chance that you're you're interested in small businesses, and 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 there's an excellent chance if you're here that you're you're here because you want to get better, and that's what we all have to do. We all have to get better. The world is moving too fast. We can't stop learning. And we have to keep up with things. We have to wear our track shoes every day. And so I want to congratulate you on being here because that says a lot about you. Because I will tell you, a lot of your competitors wouldn't come to an event like this, wouldn't go to a, to a, a listen to a webinar. And guess what? You know what that means? That means you can beat them. That means you can become more relevant than them. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So thank you for being here. Uh, by the way, I want to say, I want to thank the, 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 the ASBDC there in Bakersfield. Uh, I love small business development centers. I've been supporting them for 20 years, longer than that, actually. And uh, I love the work that they do. Elizabeth and Tom and, and all the folks there, they do such a great job. Uh, really leaders, really serious leaders uh, in the marketplace. And I'm, I'm so proud of the work that they're doing. Okay, so I'm not really good at standing still. So if, if even though I'm in the little window here, you can see my handsome face. I may, be, I may move around a little bit, so don't get sidetracked with that. Let's talk about the age of the customer. So, you know who these guys are? You know what these people They seem to be great, right? What is the holy grail for them? That's what it is, right? Well, who are these people? They look a lot like you guys. What do they see? They also seek a holy grail. Like Customers. So now that we've got that out of, off, we got that organized. We we know what we're all we're all in agreement on what our holy grail is. More customers, right? Let's talk about the age of the seller. The, the age of the seller is ten thousand years old. When Proto Market was born ten thousand years ago, Og, he's the little guy on the right there. Og dropped his weapon one day and looked at Gog, the big guy on the left. They'd been beating each other up with clubs to get the, what the other guy wanted. And so Og said to God, you know, I'm getting the wrong end of the deal here. Let's stop fighting and start doing business. And at that moment, Proto Market was born. And, and you and I are the beneficiaries of, of, that, of that single event. And, and all, all along the way, for 10,000 years, there was a, a beautiful, exquisite, millennial-old dance that was conducted between the buyer and the seller, the customer and the business. And so it, there were three basic steps. Three steps that you that, that, that were, were developed, and those things haven't changed. For, the first step is that the seller owned the product. 
The seller owned the information about the product. The customer owned the buying decision, right? That's, that's how we've done it for 10,000 years. Here's what it looks like graphically. Notice the level of control. I want you to notice the ratio of control in the age of the seller, the 10,000 year old age of the seller. Look at the product. Who owns the product? The seller does. Who owns the information? The seller does. Who owns the buying decision? The customer controls that. That's the way it's been for 10,000 years. That little sliver there, word of mouth, if I, could, if I could hear you, I'd be asking you, what is the definition of word of mouth? And the smart ones in, your, in, the, in the crowd would be saying that word of mouth is this. If I like you, I'll tell someone. If I don't like you, I'll tell 10 someones. That's the old fashioned uh, analog age, the age of the seller, word of mouth. That's the way it worked. Okay, then something happened. This never happened before in the history of markets, in the history of mankind. The printing press didn't do it, the telephone didn't do it, radio, television, none of that did it. A brand new marketplace age was formed by the, the introduction of these things. All these things that you and I know and love, the computer, the internet, uh, high-speed uh, Wi-Fi and, and the ubiquity of wireless, all those things came together to create a new age, what I call the age of the customer. Now this dance, remember the dance I told you about? It's, it hasn't changed in terms of the dance. It still has the three basic steps to this dance. The product, the information, and the buying decision. Except that now you and I can continue to own the product as a seller. The customer continues to own the buying decision. Those two things haven't changed. But what about the information about that? Well, that has changed, right? Here's what it looks like now. You and I control the product because it comes out of our shops. The customer still owns the buying decision, but look what happened to the information. You and I now co-own at best the information. And what happened, look at that little sliver. Remember the little piece of pie that's there that was the word of mouth? Well, that transmogrified into UGC. Raise your hand if you know what UGC means. I see your hands out there, one or two of you. Don't feel bad if you don't know what this means, because I hear speeches all the time about this, and it's rare that anybody knows what UGC means, but you really should. And I talk about this a lot in the book. UGC means user-generated content. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on. But user-generated content is, the, is word of mouth on steroids. If I like you, I'll tell someone. If I don't like you, I'll tell a million someones right? Facebook, Twitter, etc. So that's what UGC is. In the age of the customer, this is the ratio. Let's put them side by side. What do you think about this transition, folks? What do you think about how this has changed? Look at the ratio of control from the age of the seller to the age of the customer. I've had people almost get up out of the chair at speeches and, and I, I say, say, where are you going? They say, I think after seeing this, I need to get back to my office. I, I gotta, I'm losing control. It's, I mean, I've seen cold sweat break out on foreheads when they see this ratio. Look at the, look at the dramatic shift. And folks, this is just now happening for the first time in 10,000 years. So the customer is now in control. They often don't realize they're in control, but they like this power. So for, a long time now, for several years, we've been living in what I'm calling a parallel universe. It looks like this. For 10,000 years, we had the age of the seller. About 1993, something new happened. What do you think, why do you think I chose 93 as the birth of the age of the customer? Why would you think I chose 93? Well, if you said the internet, you'd be correct. Because this month, literally, right about now, maybe in the next couple of weeks, 25 years ago, 25 years ago, right now, you and I were first given the opportunity to use the internet commercially. So this was the birth, that was the birth, what I call the birth of the age of the customer. Let me tell you a real quick story, you'll like this story. So a good friend of mine, Mike Daniels, was, was in the same building, actually in the, in the cubicle next to the two guys who invented the internet, Surf, and I've forgotten the other guy's name. I always forget his name, Kim, I think. Anyway, those two guys invented the internet. Never mind what you heard about, uh, uh, about uh, uh, Al Gore. 
And by the way, he does deserve some credit. He, he did some things to help the internet. I'll go into that another time, another day. But the these two guys invented the internet. Well, in 89, think about this. In 89, four years before you and I got the internet, someone asked one of the one of the, these two founders of the internet, should we let people have it? Should we let regular people have the internet for their use? And he thought about it and he said, what would they do with it? <laughs> the, inter the developer of the internet had no idea what we would do with it. And of course, as we know, the world has changed uh, uh, dramatically more than any other time any other time in our history. So I wanted to give, oh, by the way, 25, 2025, that's just an arbitrary number. I figured I'd be tired of talking about this by 2025. So I stuck that number out there. All right, so I wanted to give the, the parallel universes some energy. And what better place to talk about this than California? You guys, I mean, I go, I go to, I go to the East Coast talking about this, and nobody knows what subduction is. If there's anybody who knows what subduction is, it's Californians, right? You know what that is. When two te tectonic plates of the Earth's crust come together, one of them is going to give. A big event is going to happen, and one of them is going to get subducted by the other. And the one that's sub doing the subducting wins, the other one goes under. Well, in this case, the age of the customer is subducting the age of the seller. And I don't know anywhere that that would have more impact than in California. So you see what I'm what I'm getting at. This think about this as we as we move through the rest of the slides here today. So the thing of what do you think is the single greatest force? What is the energy behind this subduction? This 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 movement? This force called the age of the customer? Do you think it's the internet? That'd be a good answer. You think it's technology? That'd be another good answer. You think it rush, it's Russia's Facebook account? <laughs> it's neither one of those, really. The single greatest force that's creating the energy for the age of the customer is customer expectations. Expectations. This is going to be on the test. Write that down. Customer expectations. So this, let's talk about where we've been. If you look, if you look at this slide, notice 93. You see that from your date. Notice the gray area there under customer expectations. That's age of the seller expectations. By that I mean in 93 to 2008, you could still make a living and, and do nothing but age of the seller practices. Like Tom talked about earlier and like I, like I did for, for, for decades. I, I made my living as an age of the seller person. But the age of the customer expectations started creeping in as, as all this capability gave gave power to customers, right? Now, why did I choose 2008 as a line of, of, of demarcation there? That is the period, that's about the time when social media kicked in. And so I said social media really accelerated the, the transition from the age of the seller to the age of the customer. So that's the reason why you see that, that line, it, uh, in the, 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 the the angle of the line increasing so much. So now let's move over to the other side of this graph. Look, but first, look at how small the red is. That's how sort of how few customers would let you, were demanding, were expecting you to provide them with age of the, of the customer uh, capability. Now look at it. Look at 2018. Look at where we're going. Can you see, if, if you're an audio file, you know about headroom, right? <clears throat> well, look down there at the gray area. If you're, a, if you're an age of the seller company, if you're an age of the seller person, you're running out of headroom. You're running out of people who will allow you to do business with them the old way, which includes cold calling, which includes not asking them what they already know when they drop in your store, not finding out what they've already learned, et cetera, et cetera. Or, and a number of other things that we're gonna talk about in a minute. You're running out of headroom and you'll see that as time goes by, you're gonna to have to start making, if you're gonna survive, you're gonna to have to learn how to approach customers, deal with customers, acquire customers, curry their favor, get their business with age of the customer, uh, dealing with their age of the customer expectations. 
So, what does your customer look like? Probably somebody like that, grumpy old guy like me. Might be somebody who looks like this. Probably looks like somebody like this. A prospect too, right? Prospects look like this. What do you think is on her mind? Well, let's talk about the definition of a customer. A customer in my day, so to speak, in the age of the seller, a customer was a customer. But first they were a suspect. And especially if you're B2B, those B2B salesmen, business to business salespeople out there, you had suspects. That was the phone book. You took the suspects and you qualified them into prospects. You determined that they were going to buy from you. And then you converted them into customers and other people who wrote your checks. These were the influencers. I talk in a book a lot about influencers. These are the influencers in your life in the age of the seller. In the age of the customer, there are two other influencers. Users. Two billion Facebook users. I don't know how many zillions of Twitter users. Uh, on, and all the, all, everybody who, remember I talked about user-generated content? Everybody who writes a, a review on any website is a user. Now, what do we know about users? They probably, you probably never met them. They don't even know you personally. You don't know them. They've probably never been in your store. They probably just went to your website and they liked it or they didn't like it. And regardless of what they saw, like or no, they wrote something about it and they're influencers on your business. This is something we have today. We didn't have in the age of the, of the seller. We didn't have users. Now we have them and they're not, they don't buy from us, but we still have, they still have an opinion and they let people know about it. And whether you like that or not, this is what we have to deal with. Another group of, of again, customers, so to speak, are community members. We, we're humans, we gaggle together, we like, to, we like to get in our tribes, we like to hang out with people, we like to talk about what we like and what we don't like. We like to brag and complain, right? All those things. We do that in communities. And Mr. Zuckerberg and Facebook, he's on the hot seat today, but, but he and other platforms have given people the ability to do this. Perhaps your own company has created communities. I hope you have. You, you need to be doing that. You need to be creating communities inside of your customer base. People of like mind, help them hang out with each other and talk about how much they love you. Communities, major influencers today. We didn't have that before. This is huge. This is a big deal in how things have changed. This is a big part of the, of the, of the paradigm shift from the age of the seller to the age of the customer. All right. So take a breath there, and I'm going to get a little water, and just think about some of these things. So, what's the definition of expectation? There are two words that are the essence of the age of the seller. Competitiveness and service. If you were, if you were in the age of the seller, prior to 1993, prior to 2008, you could say, we got the biggest inventory, we got the best salespeople, we got more whatever of this and that, and we're the, we got the best prices in town. And our service people, better than everybody. We're, and you, you invested your money. You woke up in the morning thinking, what's my competitive advantage? What's my unique selling proposition? All those things, right? We all did. I did it. I made a living that way. I raised a family doing that. It worked once upon a time. That was a nice trip down memory lane, wasn't it? Now, that's the age of the seller. And here's what it looks like. The, our little king here. I've had, I've had this slide for, for a long time, just before some of you were born. He's saying, we'll win because we're the strongest and we have the best weapons. That's an age of the seller comment. That's an age of the seller thought process, uh, 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 philosophy, I should say. That's how he's thinking. If you're thinking that way, you need to stop thinking that way. So that's the competitive advantage. So, but there are the, the two words that are the essence of the age of the customer are relevance and expectations. So relevance is, we'll talk about that in a minute. And, and, and we'll talk about expectations as well. Here's what she's thinking. Remember our little, our, 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 our prospect earlier? She's, is she thinking about price? She's saying, how is this relevant to me and my expectation? 
she's not thinking about price right now. And and she's, she says, oh, good, they have a mobile site. I'll need that tomorrow. That's relevance, my friend. While she's thinking about relevance, he's saying we're bigger and stronger. We have the best weapons. That's the reason I call this the ironic war. So the ironic war is the little general there, the little king, is, is fighting a war. Now, let me ask you this question. How many of you, be honest with yourself, how many of you in the last year, five, ten years, have, have awakened in the morning going to get ready to go to work and you, you felt like you were in a war? Or at the end of the day, you, you, as you locked up your business, you thought, darn, this has just been like a war today. That's what is going on. If you're, if you're an age of the seller thinker and practitioner, you feel like you're in a war. That king feels like he's fighting a war, but guess what? She is going to win the war. You, you know why? She does, well, she's going to win the war, but she not only isn't going to fight in the war, she doesn't even know there is a war. That's the reason I call it the ironic war. She's going to win. He's going to lose. She doesn't even know there is a war. And it's because she's thinking relevance based on her expectations. And he's thinking all she cares about is how much I charge her. Now, we're going to talk about all that. We're going to continue to break this down as we go through. So relevance. Relevance, my friends, is the new coin of the realm. Before anybody this finds out, before a prospect finds out if you're cheaper or not, they probably have ruled you in or out based on whether you're relevant to them, based on some of these components. If you're a business to consumer business, you have to save them time. You have to find a way to save them time. More and more people are valuing their time more than their money. If you, you have to have the current technology. What do I mean by that? And I know you're saying, I can't out technology Amazon, I can't out technology uh, whoever. I, and, and I'm not telling you you should try. But I will tell you this, you don't have to win the technology race with Amazon or any of the other companies. But you do have to be in the race. You have to participate in the race. And what does that mean? That means you have to develop a reasonable level of technological support for your customers so that they can see, they recognize that you don't have a uh, uh, hundred quants uh, developing algorithms for you. They know that. But if you're trying, if you're giving them some element, you're, you're sending them an email when their order's in, or you're sending them an email when their progress is in, or you're prepared to, to text them, or if you ask them for a picture or something, you can take a photo and, and, and text it to them, or, or you can remind them six months from now when their tires need to be rebalanced or whatever by, by, by an email or something like that. Anything like that is you running in the race. And your customers will give you credit for that. You don't have to win the race, the technology race, but you do have to, you have to run. You have to participate. And of course, as you know, the good news is the technology is getting cheaper and more granular for you and me. So that's really important. Trust. Remember what I said about Og and Gog? When Og dropped, that, dropped his club and uh, he trusted that Gog would listen to him. When Gog dropped his club, and, and they decided to do business together, none of that would happen without trust. Trust was there at the moment of the birth of Proto Market. And today, 2018, trust is more powerful and more important and more essential and more imperative than ever before. Trust is no longer just the right thing to do. It's a best practice. Here's why. I know you agree with me when I say that things are moving faster. Things are moving like lightning, right? There's, it's literally lightning. The speed of light 
and, and gigahertz, right? Billions of cycles per, a bits per second. If, if things are moving that fast, and I know I can trust you to support me as I support my customers, I'm going to pay you more. If I have to pay you more to maintain that trust, if you can justify, if you can say, if you can say, Jim, I've got to beef up my technology, and when I do that, I can I can serve you better, and you can you can count on me more and more. But I'm going to have to raise my prices four percent or so. All you got to do is justify that. If I can trust you, I'll pay it because I can pass it on to my people. Never underestimate the power and the best practice of trust. It's more powerful than ever before. And in the future, one of these days, we're probably going to do another webinar, and I'll I'll spend more time on this as we go as we go forward. Values. Let's talk about values. So trust is what we expect of each other. Values are what I expect of myself. What do I stand for? What do I care about? Well, you probably heard, you've probably heard people talk about millennials and their values. I like to, I like to tell people that millennials are probably the best human beings we've ever raised. And I mean that. Uh, they drive me crazy sometimes, but I love them because they are probably the best people we've ever raised, the most unpretentious generation we've ever known. And they're, they care about values, and they're looking for those kinds of things in values. Now, let me, give you, let me give you a quick example of how this converts into the real marketplace. So if you, if you type in, in in the browser window, back scratcher, and, and, and you say buy back scratchers for sale, let's say. Well, you're going to get a list from Amazon, 143 back scratchers. I counted them. There are 143 back scratchers on Amazon. And they can sell them to you. But if you'll notice, from the first one to the last one, there's not a nickel's worth of difference in any of them. Why would, how would people decide which one of those to buy? Which, why would they, how would they pick the top one over the bottom one if there's not much difference? It's almost like a, uh, an embarrassment of riches, right? Well, they're going to be looking for something that's relevant to them because they're not worried about the price. Nobody wakes up in the morning anymore. Nobody wakes up in the morning anymore and says, and says uh, you know, well, uh, can I get what I want at the price I want? Nobody does that. So now we're looking for things that are more relevant to them. Okay, do they have some technology that I can that I'm can attract you to? Is their website mobile? When I when I when I go there on my smartphone, is there does a website convert to a mobile format? That's huge, my friends. I'm gonna talk about that in a second. Those are those are test technology. And is there something about their website that tells me I can trust them? Uh, is there a video of, of, of the owner talking about how to use the product? and values, you know, they're looking for things like that. So this is B2C relevance. B2B relevance is exactly like B2C relevance, except for one thing, one more thing. Help your customers help their customers. Help your customers help their customers. When you call on a customer, hi, I'm Jim, Good. how you like me so far? When you call on a customer, don't, just say, what do you need? What can I say to you today? Sit down and say, tell me about your customers. What do you do to serve your customer? Really? Is that right? How's that working? Are you, are you able to do everything you need for them? What if, if you could name one thing that you could that you would like to improve your relationship with customers, where you could serve them better, what would that be? And then try to help them find that. If you want a customer you can't run off, help your customer help their customer. I've gone four deep. I've helped a customer, help a customer, help a customer, help a customer. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever done in my life. And you can do it too. And if you do it, it is, it is the most powerful relevance that you can ever deliver to a customer. Notice that I'm, I'm telling you that people are making decisions about who to do business with based on this kind of stuff, and we haven't even mentioned price. There's not even a proposal on the table. This is the coin of the realm. Relevance trumps competitiveness. Now, I want to remind you, nobody is going to pay you more than they should. I'm not telling you you don't have to be competitive. I'm telling you it's not first anymore. They're ruling you in or out. 
based on your relevance. Because they, remember, they got 143 to choose from. How do I get rid of all these? How do I triage this down to one or two? They're not doing it by price because they're all the same price. They're doing it by relevance. And if you want to win, you have to do this. You have to be relevant. All right. The moment of relevance. You know what the moment of relevance is, right? There it is. <laughs> there, there it is. Pow. <laughs> the moment of relevance. It's, uh, it's, it's real fast these days. People are ruling you in or out in this moment of relevance. What is she thinking? In a second, a split second, she's determined this website doesn't navigate very well. Bam, you're ruled out. You're gone. You're history. She doesn't even know if you're cheaper or not. You could be the cheapest. You could save her a fortune. She's going to rule you out because she doesn't like your website. You Believe me when I tell you people are doing that. This guy helped me help my customers. That's a customer you can't run off. Relevance. She didn't say he was cheaper. She said he helped me with my customers. This There's an email telling me my order is ready. Even though maybe she paid a little bit more. In the new age, customers have access to virtually all the information they need before you know they're interested. And prospects are similarly informed before you even know they exist. That ought to scare the bejeebers out of you because, well, it's just, uh, it's just the way it is. This is the control I've been telling you about. This is how, if, if you're wondering, if you're wondering why your salespeople, why your, your website isn't doing as much business, why you're not getting many prospects off your website, if you're, why are my salespeople not selling as much? My best salespeople for the last 20 years, all of a sudden they, don't, they aren't selling very well. It's because of things like this. That you're, you're, it's not their fault, probably. It's your fault if you haven't brought your company into the age of the customer. The moment of relevance is a silent killer of those who focus too much on being competitive and not much on being relevant. Let me give you a real quick quick story. So you and I are in Peoria, Illinois, and we're hungry, and we're looking for pizza. And so I go onto my smartphone and I say, pepperoni pizza in Peoria. Pepperoni pizza in Peoria. Now it pops to uh, the whole list. The first one has the best pizza in town. It's the cheapest. But the, I click on the, web, on, the, on the link, the website doesn't go to a mobile window, mobile screen. Well, that's not relevant to me, so I get rid of it. It's cheaper. They got the best pizza, but they just lost because I want it to come up in my screen. Now, I'm an old guy, so maybe I'll noodle around with it, but you know what I'm talking about. The young people won't do it. So you go to the second one, and they have a mobile site. They're farther away, they're more expensive, and they order their crust in from fr frozen. But right now, all you know is, they were more relevant to you. And you have to go to another level of, of, of qualification to find out if, if they want to do business, if they're going to do business with you. But right now, you're on top. So think about that a little bit. The moment of relevance is a silent killer of those who focus too much on being competitive and not enough on being relevant. In the age of the customer, the greatest danger is not being uncompetitive, it's becoming irrelevant. And I want you to know something. If customers don't come back in the age of the customer, they're not mad at you. You're presuming they even care about you. They're not mad at you. They just, you know, irrelevance isn't an emotion. It's just, I'm gone. I'm going to go do something else. They don't even think about it. If you, if you walked up to a customer who hadn't been doing business with you before and you knew they would some, they'd be going somewhere else, if you walked to them up, on, up to them on the street and you said, hey, how come you haven't been coming back to me? My, how come you haven't been doing business with me? They probably would say, huh, I didn't realize I hadn't. Oh, I guess you're right. I hadn't even thought about it. They're not even thinking about it. You're, 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 thinking, you, you're thinking too much of yourself. I can tell you that. Irrelevance happens all the time. and if, if Irrelevance is a kiss of death. So this, I'm not going to, don't worry. I'm not going to, this is not death by PowerPoint. I'm not going to make you read all these. I wanted to show you something. On the left is a list of, of, of a lot of major business, uh, business uh, uh, expectations that customers have. On the right is the, is the, is the conforming uh, age of the, this is age of the, of the seller on the left, age of the customer on the right. 
So these are the, how we replace those on the left with the ones on the right. But notice at the bottom, just go to the very bottom. Notice that there's, there's one line there at the bottom where there's nothing on the left and there's one thing on the right. What does it say? Mobile computing, right? Mobile computing was in any part of your past, but it will dominate your future. Do you have a mobile site? It'll cost you less than $1,000, maybe $500 to get a mobile site. I'm not talking about a mobile app. I don't want you to get a mobile app. You got to justify a mobile app. Most people don't need that. You got to have a mobile site, my friends. If you don't have a mobile site, you're, you're going to be irrelevant before you even get out of the box for most people. More and more people are living their life on their smartphone. About a million people today, a million people in the world are getting a smartphone and they're going online for the first time on a smartphone and those same people, those million people around the world have never owned up, they've never been on the, on, on the internet before. They've never owned a PC. They don't even own a microwave, but they got a smartphone and they're going to start doing business on that device, this magic wand in our hand. If you don't have a mobile phone, a, a mobile uh, a desktop, I'm sorry, a mobile website, a, mo uh, a small window conforming website, you're, you're irrelevant. So do you think it's disruption or opportunity? It's both, right? It's disrupting you if you don't have one, if, if it's... It's, it's not even an opportunity, really. It's, it's minimal expectations of you. So I, I, I talked about the mobile app and the mobile site a minute ago. Mobile computing, I'll say it again, is not part of your past, but it will dominate your future. Believe that, folks. Write that down. This is going to be on the test. All right. The rules of selling have changed. Probably more accurately, the rules of prospecting have changed. All right, so I'm going to go into this real fast. This is age of the seller example. And this is, consider this to be it's like a six month period. Uh, if, let's say it's business to business and we got a, it's, it's a, a six month selling cycle. In the old days, in the gray area there, step one, I would, I might send a letter, I might make a phone call, I might drop by, I might cold call, I might get a referral, but pretty soon, I wouldn't wait too long, I'd walk right up to that, to that office I'd walk right in that office and whoever was the gatekeeper, we called them the screen. Whoever was the gatekeeper, I'd walk up and I'd say, hi, I'm Jim, how do you like me so far? And me and, me and nine other people would do the same thing. 10 of us would come to that, to that office and try to walk in there and get by the screen to the decision maker. Only seven of us would make it. The other three would not be smart enough or capable enough to do it. Only, but seven of us would get in and what that meant was the decision maker had to make, had to deal with seven proposals, seven demonstrations, et cetera, et cetera. You know why? Because we were his internet or we were her internet. They needed to know, maybe I knew most of what they needed to know, but another one knew something else and another one knew something else. They needed to gather all this information to make the right decision. It was brutal to have to do all that. To have to, I mean, the, the, the hours you could spend on a big decision. That was the age of the, of the seller. Now in control, customers are self-qualifying themselves and pre-qualifying you. Folks, if you're, a, if, you're, if you're in sales, business to business sales, and you don't know this, if you're managing a sales force and you don't know this, then you're a dinosaur. Now, if you know it today, you're not a dinosaur tomorrow if you do something about it. They're self-qualifying themselves pre-qualifying you before you even know they exist. This is the age of the customer example. Notice it's still six months. Notice that that gray air, that gray grid line transitioned from the screen to what I call the relevance firewall. Notice that it got moved over. So instead of taking a month or less to get into up to that point, I'm saying it took about another, it took about another month and a half, say a couple of months, two and a half months to get up to the, the relevance firewall. More things have to be done. You have to meet people. You can't cold calling, write this down folks, cold calling in the age of the customer is a fool's errand. Cold calling is a fool's errand. How many times do I need to say that? Cold calling is a fool's errand. In the old days, you could cold call because if I walked up and cold called on a customer, 
They didn't mind me doing that because their salespeople were doing the same thing. But now, I believe cold calling actually has a negative impact on your brand. I think if you call on somebody unannounced, unexpected, they're saying to themselves, he or she has no more consideration for my time. They're presuming I have nothing else to do than to sit around and wait on them to call on me. It's not good, my friends. So you did all these other things. In the age of the seller, I'm sorry, in the age of the customer, you do all these other things to, to find a way to get into the point where you're invited in. You've been invited in. And I've got to, in, a, in another time, if I, if I talk to you another time, and, and of course the book, there's a lot of things in chapter 16. This is all in chapter 16, page 119 of the book. So if you get through the relevance firewall, Remember what I said about the 10 people that tried to get in? Seven didn't get in earlier. I mean, seven got in, three didn't. In this case, because they did so much work getting being relevant, not competitive, the, the, the decision maker isn't going to let you in by whether you're competitive or not. They're going to let you in based on whether you're relevant. They'll find out about competitive later. So you're going to get through the relevance firewall. Three of you will get in, not seven. The other seven weren't capable. They didn't do the work. They didn't do the relevance work. They didn't nurture the, the, the prospect. Three got in. But guess what, my friends? Maybe only two. You know what else? In the age of the customer, because they can self-qualify themselves and pre-qualify you, maybe only one. And that might be you. Or if it's not you, then you got ruled out. Right? So what I'm saying is you may if you do your homework, if you if you load this prospect up with relevance and you make sure you know what it is that they're that they don't know, don't tell them stuff they already know, you're wasting their time, it makes them mad. Find out what they don't know, what do they need to know, what's relevant to them. And if you're the one that does that better than anybody, you could show up for the final day of the presentations expecting to have a room full of people in there, competitors. You can show up and there's nobody in the room and you're thinking, have I come to the wrong place? Am I here early? Did I miss the meeting? Is it late? And the, and the decision maker says, come on in. You say, where is everybody? And, and the decision maker says, there isn't anybody else. You're going to get the business. That could happen. It's happened to me. All right. Go take a gulp and, 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 and process all that for a second. Let's move on. Oh, oh, yeah, one more slide. I want to show you side, top to bottom, side by side. Look at the motion. Look at the movement. Look at the different steps. Oh, I know one other thing I want to tell you. On the right side, in the red side, the step two, those steps haven't changed. Only the prospecting side has changed. So only on the, pros pros the prospecting side has changed. and. Um, hang on a second, here we go. On the prospecting side has changed. And so um, closing is the same, demonstration is the same, all that's the same. So, so be sure, to, uh, be sure to, to pay attention to that and, uh, and just focus on the first part especially. All right, what's love got to do with it? In the age of the customer, it's okay to fall in love with what you do. It's not okay to fall in love with how you do it. That's going to be on the test. It's okay to fall in love with what you do. It's not okay to fall in love with how you do it. You've got to reinvent yourself, folks. If you're an age of the seller company person, you're not going to, you're not going to survive. You're a dinosaur, and you're going to become extinct if you can't make the conversion. In the age of the customer, the greatest danger is not becoming uncompetitive. It's becoming irrelevant. I love what Rashad said. I'm mad at him because he said it before I did. The future does not fit in the container of the past. Which tectonic plate is your business on? Are you, is your, think of, think of it as, as, as your one foot is on the dock and one foot is on the boat. What do we know about boats and docks? Boats leave docks. One foot on the dock, one foot on the boat. Are you gonna get in the boat? You're gonna get in the, stand up, stay on the dock. The boat's leaving the dock. And that's the age of the customer. I've enjoyed this. I hope you have. I hope I've helped you a little bit. Um, I hope I've scared you a little bit. If, you, if you're an age of the seller company, if you're an age of the seller person, 
I hope I've scared the heck out of you because that's maybe what it takes to get you to make some adjustments, to do some changes. Because I'm going to tell you something, my friends. This is not optional. The age of the customer is not optional. This, trans, this paradigm shift has already happened. So you gotta, you got to make the shift. Now, Elizabeth talked earlier about some books that we're going to give away. I'm going to try to talk her into I, I have my own publishing company. I'm going to give you a few extra books. I'm going to... I'm gonna put some more books out there so you guys can have. I'll autograph them, and, and when they, uh, when they, uh, uh, when they, when you sell them on eBay, I, it will affect the price, but I can't promise you which way. So thank you for your time. I've enjoyed this very much. Let's get the let's get the host back in here and and see what they, see what they need to do. I think we got some questions, right, guys? Absolutely. Yes, sir. And I know we, in the interest of time. answers i have to say though jim thank you very much i having read the book all the the highlights are there in your presentation and i appreciated that i kind of feel like in my old sales days uh, you eliminated all the objections at the end because it was covered during your presentation you did a wonderful job we did have one uh question well we had several questions some are very specific to their industry and okay. what we'd like to do is uh, meet with those people and we can get to the heart of that. But one was really good. It said, without cold calling, how do you even make your prospect aware of, say, your new service or product? Well, that's a hard one. I'm, I'm not going to say I'm not going to say it's easy. But here's what you have to remember. Tom, when you and I were coming up as pups, a person in business, a, a prospect of ours, they went to work believing, knowing, expecting to get called on by vendors all day long, didn't they? Yes, they did. They would just drop in. It was the way things were. Today, think about this. Whether you whether you figured it out or not, who do you know who goes to work today and says, I'll probably have several vendors drop by, and when they do, I'll just let them in. Who does good that point. anymore? Good Nobody point. does that. So whether, you, whether I give you the silver bullet or you come up with it or you don't, that's not going to change the prospect's expectations. See, that's the main thing to remember. So now let's talk about what you can do. What I would do is I would take my list of suspects. I would obviously that's where you start, right? You start out if you're B two B, especially you start out with a list of, of suspects, and I would find out if anybody possibly knows anyone. Uh, uh, Bill Brown. Wait, my neighbor's Brown. My neighbor's name is Brown. Hey George, you know Bill Brown who operates this this uh, uh, plant over here. Yeah, that's my cousin. You want to meet him? I mean, those, that's try to get referrals, and and I would. I, you can, there's several things that I identify there. You can write them a letter. You can. Um, uh, you, I would try to find. I would try to find if, if if it's that important to you. I would try to find where they, what what they do. Are they members of the chamber? Would they be likely to show up at a chamber mixer? Would they? Would they? You know, where would they go? Do they, do they like local government? Would they be likely to go to the city council? I would try to find it, and you can call it stalking if you want to. I don't mind, but I'd try to find a place where they are, and I'd try to find a way to get introduced to them. And when I got introduced to them, I would say, "Hi, I'm Jim. Uh, I, I just want, I've been wanting to meet you for a long time. Shake their hand and just say, I'd like to. Could I exchange cards with you? That's all I want to do." Can I just exchange cards with you and exchange cards and then do an about face and walk away? Don't try to sell them anything. Don't ask them for an appointment. Do nothing but get your face in front of them. And then, then, oh, LinkedIn. Don't forget LinkedIn. Then you can go to them on LinkedIn and say, uh, hey, George, we met the other day at the, at the city council meeting. I'd like to, I'd like to, I'd like to join you and link together on LinkedIn. Hopefully they'll they'll accept you. Then you could now that you're on LinkedIn, you can do a direct message. Hey George, I've got something I want to give you. I've got a book that I, I think you'd like. Could I drop it by next week? You see what I'm getting at? But it's work. It's shoe leather. It's detective work. It's elbow grease, Tom. I concur with everything you said. That that's excellent. And there are entities in in all our towns here uh, for. Uh, networking and connecting with people and I particularly like if someone has a finite uh, kind of list of uh, suspects uh, they're a little easier to approach uh, even with the letters as you suggested 
I know in the interest of time, time you said is, is the relevance to everyone. Uh, maybe just another comment, and then I'd like to ask another qu quick question. Uh, it's this value issue. It's kind of funny over the years, I've always helped so many clients uh, develop a, a mission, vision, and value statement. And, and over the years, I felt that the value side got a little weaker, or maybe they didn't want to talk about it. And it's so pertinent to what you're talking about. You can't go into those communities without honesty and, and, and values uh, that reflect your company that obviously match this community of people who obviously find that relevant. How, um, I'm, I'm wondering, maybe we should uh, talk about your new book because you had alluded when we first- Can I, can I talk about, can work. I talk, Liz, Elizabeth, can I talk, do I have time to talk about values for a minute? You can, yes. Absolutely. All right, so look, there was a time, Tom, you, you alluded to it a minute ago and you were right. There was a time when if you talked about your values, it sounded like you were bragging. You could never get away with that. Yes. But today, here's an example of values, believe it or not. I define them a lot of different ways. If, you ha if you've determined that the average employee in your company has 14 years or 20 years or nine years or whatever, put that up on your website. Our employees have an average tenure of 12 years. Guess what? That tells people who, remember, remember those, those 143 batch graduates and everybody had almost the same price? Yes. If they see, if they see that, they're going to say, wow, they must treat people right. I want to do business with them. It's values. Or, or, or if they see a snapshot somewhere where the, 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 all the employees were, were working for the Heart Fund or, 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 something, or something else, they did a, the run for life or whatever it might be, you're not bragging about that. You're just showing people what you guys do. It's, it's fun, right? And people see those things. They're attracted to those things. Now, is that going to get you the business? Maybe not. But it sure will help you not get ruled out before they even know if they want to do business with you, which is which not having those things up there is likely to do. And that's interesting you say that because I notice, especially with millennials uh, as uh, fresh entrepreneurs, there's always an altruistic uh, component to their business uh, model. And I just love that about them. They're but, just I, but, you, but, you, but you still you still want to make sure that it's in context. Your values have to be in context. They can't be you know, gratuitous, that kind of thing. So go ahead with your other question. My, well, my last question, I think, for the interest of time, like I said, uh, I, I thought you said when we first uh, talked about the fact that you have a new book coming out yeah. as we speak, it had something to do kind of with the value issue as well. Tell us about this new book. I'm anxious to read it. The new book is called is called the uh, the third ingredient. I think you got a copy there. You can hold it up for. Both. I can do that if I may. Just now, you can just now buy it on Amazon. It's already won a gold medal. I'm really proud of this book. This book is about another paradigm shift that's happened in along a parad paradigm that ran concurrent with the age of the seller, and I call it our analog ethics. So let me give you a, let me give you a couple of motivations to to think about the book. And I think, Elizabeth, are we going to come back and do a webinar in the future on this? Did I do a good enough job to get invited back? Oh, absolutely. We're okay. hoping to have you back in early June, and we can really dig into this hot topic that people need, need to know and want to know more about. Let me give you a little teaser on it. Everything, everything that Mark Zuckerberg is going through this week and last week, Every element of that whole Facebook and Cambridge Analytica process, including the Congress, 100% of all that is why I wrote that book, is what that book is about. And I'll tell you something else. Did you hear, did you hear Wozniak, the, the Apple co-founder, say the other day he was going to get rid of his Facebook account and because, because the users were creating the profits, but they weren't getting the profits? I predicted that would happen in my book. There's a lot of stuff in there. Um, but anyway, you can buy it on eBay, you can buy it on, on Amazon, I should say, right now. And uh, we're going to come back in June. I think we'll talk about it again. But uh, I hope you like it. It's, it's, uh, I'm really proud of it. And, and uh, um, so anyway, I've enjoyed this. Thank you for letting me share some ideas. God bless you. I'm, I'm proud of you guys out there for all you do in small business. What you do, small business owners, is the most important thing of anything that's done in the marketplace. I don't even want to think about where America or the world would be without you, small business owners. What's good for small business is good for the world. And that's the reason why I'm so proud of Tom and Elizabeth for the hard work they're doing supporting you. And I promise you, they don't do it for the money. 
Thank you so much, Jim. That was an amazing presentation. And we're, we're really looking forward to having this open for people to view again. And we are so excited to have you come back in June and really dig into the third ingredient. Thank you. And thank you I'm so sure. much. And everybody have a great day. And we're signing off from Webinar Central. Talk to you soon.